Good morning. My name is Hal Levin, and I'm the chair of the session. And we have actually two sessions uh, designed as one continuous program uh, this morning. And then after lunch, we have a workshop where we want to ask those of you who are uh, not part of our invited participants for the Sloan program, but the so-called practitioner community to come and to help us understand what it is that the microbial ecologists can do to improve the accessibility and usefulness of their tools for you in, in your work. So the, the program of the two sessions, this one and the other one before lunch, are intended to give you an overview of what the microbial ecologists are doing and our understanding their understanding, I'm not a microbial ecologist, of, of what it is that, that uh, they're doing that could be of interest to you. So I hope you will all come to all three sessions, and especially the third session, be very vocal about your interests and your needs. And um, we, it, the session is really uh, organized to, to invite your comments and suggestions. We're having a scientific meeting afterwards to try to address the questions and problems that you bring to us in the session. Um, before I introduce the first speaker, I want to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for funding our little mini program within the bigger program and for uh, making it possible for us to do this. So our first speaker is Jordan Petchen. He's going to give you a uh, kind of an overview and introduction, and then we have a number of topics that, from our perspective, sort of describe the, the field, the activity, in a, in a, in a sequential and, and systematic way. We would like you to not, we'd like to use the full 15 minutes for each speaker for their presentations, and that you make notes of your questions and bring them to the workshop in the afternoon where all of the speakers will be present and, and where we can have a discussion. Okay, so, Jordan. Thank you very much, Hal. Um, let's see. So, so thank you, Hal, and Mark Hernandez, and uh, Martin Talbell for the invitation. Thank you also, Oh, for the, for the great title. So they gave me this title, and I'm, I, it's okay if I use it again, I hope, some other time. Um, so let's talk about the revolution first. And I bet you didn't think this was going to be the first image on the screen. So I come from New Haven, Connecticut. It's an old city, old by United States standards, and from an old university. It's called Yale University. And so being some of these older or first cities in the United States, we like to think that we've come up with lots of new things. We're the first to do many things. We like to think, and we make a lot of claims, that we nurtured great leaders. Probably at least some of you disagree or think that comment is a little bit dubious. We have more dubious claims. We think that New Haven invented things like Frisbees, bicycles, pizzas, helicopters. Some of them really kind of crazy claims, certainly not bicycles, pizza, or hamburgers. But American football, yeah, vulcanized rubber. Helicopters, maybe, dictionary, kind of. And here's another dubious claim. So I'm going to get around to something relevant here sooner or later. Um, there was a Yale researcher in 2004 who claimed that they made the first phylogenetic library of an aerosol sampler. And that claim's dubious because I wasn't at Yale at the time that we made these libraries, and it was really the second. There was a great one made in 1996, but it wasn't for universal primers. If you remember, all these kind of phylogenetic libraries were made by cloning. And we made trees like that. We don't do that anymore. And I had hoped at the time, I thought, this is so great. We can marry things like aerosol science. We can marry things like building science with molecular biology. And there really should be a lot of gains that can be made by this. But I have to say, I don't think it was our paper on um, you know, fungal aerosols in the Arizona urban dust um, that has really made a revolution. In fact, things like events like September 11th and anthrax scare in the mail the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation be getting an interest in these background microbes in buildings and forcing, I don't think that's the wrong word, forcing, it's a good word, molecular biologists to work with engineers. And then obviously the big one is sequencing, and that's what we'll talk a little bit about today, is that 
there was, you know, if there was ever a use of this term, there was a paradigm shift in the way that we DNA sequence. We sequence now by synthesis. That means that it's very inexpensive and you can do things fast. Because we can multiplex um, sequencing, we don't have to make clones anymore. And so we can make phylogenetic libraries or taxonomic libraries very rapidly and much more inexpensively. And look at all the great things that we can do. We can catalog microbes in buildings on surfaces. We can do this in air. These are from schools in Europe, China, and the United States. These are our, 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 our fungi, obviously. And then these are heat maps sort of indicating what the concentrations are in different size fractions of air and in the floor dust as well. We can track sources. If we know the names of some of the microorganisms, and indeed there's now some formalized frameworks in some of the bioinformatic packages to track the sources. So these are sources on toilets at the University of Colorado. This is from um, Rob Knight and Noah Fierro's group. And you can see that most of it on the wall is skin microbiota. You get the gut microbiota when you get to the toilet seat and the flesh handle. We can also look at diversity. And the great thing about looking at diversity, specifically richness, is because we can sequence so deeply into the samples, we get a much more uh, a realistic image or view of microbial richness in these types of samples. And I think we're going to discuss later on today why that may or may not be so important. But, you know, I like this one. We know now, for instance, that there's the, the, the floor, at least um, by the sink, could be more diverse than, say, the faucet handle. All right. We can also compare these, these types of microbial communities, and we can do so in a quantitative way. So this is, again, from um, Rob Dunn and, and Noah Fierro's work, and I think it was in houses in North Carolina. And, um, this is a principal component analysis, and it looks at the similarities or differences between different types of treatment. So these are all microbial communities in houses, right? Um, and it's taken on the dust of the television screen. These are houses with dogs. These are houses without dogs, the open circles. You can see how dog is an important mediating factor and pretty significant in change of microbial ecology. All right, so if we want to think about all the things that we can do um, as a revolution, you know, some revolutions go well, some revolutions don't go so well, right? So let's hopefully um, evolve this revolution in a way that it does go well. So um, I'm a fan of culturing, and, and you know, I don't, I don't mean that the monkey or the ape, giving them the culturing status is a lower status. Remember, monkeys and apes are fantastic at what they do, and culturing is fantastic at what we do, that we do. But we started there, and we're moving on to DNA methods now. We're building catalogs of what's in buildings, right? We're past all this. We're in the state right now. We're making empirical associations between microbes and buildings. And hopefully, we can evolve into a better mechanistic understanding so we can design buildings better. I think we're somewhere in between the two right now. And the rest of my talk is, is sort of a plea, um, a plea to go more to the right and to evolve a little bit further. In order to do that, there's a few things that we need to do. We need to get our bioinformatics situation just a little bit more developed. It's very developed now. It's much more developed than it used to be. There are thousands and thousands of people using these types of mechanisms for all kinds of environmental and medical um, investigations. And so there's a lot of people who are invested in this. Um, but getting pipelines squared away and more standardized, using databases of microbiomes for buildings, I think, is an important um, thing to do right now, and I think it's quite important for uh, industry as well if we're going to make those transitions to practice. Improving data analysis and unraveling the, the micro-building uh, relationship in a more, using in, in a more deterministic rather than statistical fashion, I think it's quite important. Getting absolute quantitativeness in our measurements versus relative abundances is going to be very important. And then incorporating all of the molecular techniques, or at least some of the more mainline ones, in addition to sequencing amplicons, we should be producing metagenomes. We should be looking at transcriptomics. And the ones I want to talk about in the rest of the discussion today are these three bottoms. These are going to be taking care of themselves because many people are interested in these and are working on these right now. These are the ones I think need more of a push. So what I mean to a more, from more empirical to a more mechanistic approach. So previously, and not all, you know, there's been a mixture, but it's focused more on looking at lots of buildings. We look at lots of buildings, that sort of forces, forces us to do low numbers of samples per environment, low sample density um, in that environment, 
cursory building variables, ones that can be measured easily, like relative humidity, light occupancy, right? And then use statistical frameworks and confounding to work all of this stuff out, right? That's great, and it's very useful to generate hypotheses, but again, I think Mia described very well this morning that we need a more mechanistic understanding of buildings and building microbe interactions. And so to get that mechanistic understanding, uh, we need to continue and do more studies, I think, where we look at fewer buildings, but have a real spatial, temporal, and size fractionating sampling regime, right? We need to continue to do DNA sequencing, but metagenomics, transcriptomics are also important if we want to understand what the microbes are actually doing, especially if we want to understand growth. If we want to understand pathogens, we need to think more about metatranscriptomics as well. And, um, <clears throat> You know, there are, um, right now, the bioinformatic approaches are quite good, the ones that I've described sort of in the first part of the talk, but there are higher levels bio bioinformatics approaches when you get a lot of data. These are the type of big data models that Google uses. These are the type of big data models that are used in medicine and figuring out um, which genes do what in the human genome. And I think that those types of network models and other big data models applied to this situation, I think, could also be very helpful. Um, more intense study of buildings, things like ventilation, leakage, energy consumption, human activity. These are parameters that are not easy to measure and have been typically left out of a lot of our building studies. But obviously, I don't think anybody here would deny me that um, ventilation is important. And then links to the fundamentals, right? Physics, chemistry, engineering, and medicine. We know lots about chemical, biological interactions for many other, other topics. We know about particle physics. We know about mass balances. We should be using these molecular biology tools, not just to make statistical associations, but to populate these previous building models that many of us, many of you, have already produced for, for particles. OK. So an example of pushing quantitativeness, right? Right now, these data, these types of, of, of methods give us an absolute abundance. Um, and that can be good as long as the concentration of every building or every sample you look at is the same. Then it's useful information. But it turns out that that's not the same. And so comparing absolute abundance of an aerosol sample with the absolute abundance with a floor dust sample that may be two orders of magnitude higher in concentration has limited meaning. We also can't get to exposure when we think about absolute abundance. We need a, a real quantitative abundance. Or, or I'm sorry, a relative abundance. We need a real absolute abundance to do that. We've done work and just sort of saying that the absolute concentration is equal to the relative abundance, and then you do qPCR for total fungi. There's a lot of pitfalls to that type of, of approach um, for bioinformatics, especially for fungi, less for bacteria. And, and we can discuss all those pitfalls more if you'd like. But the point is, is it kind of works. This is the pyrosequencing method. Um, this was done with pyrosequencing. Um, and this is the absolute concentration that's reconstructed from total PCR and relative abundance. These are looking at these um, specific species using qPCR specific primers. And you can see it's certainly not one to one. The slope isn't perfect, but it's not bad. And if we're looking at order magnitude differences, we can get something. How much do we understand about the basics processes in buildings? I would, I would say not much. There's lots to be learned about growth in buildings still, I think. There's lots to be learned about how microbes deposit and what's the differences between those and particles, resuspension, human emissions, cell decay, how filtration works for different types of microbes, how they agglomerate together, how they work in your HVAC systems and air conditioning. I think there's still a lot of fundamental processes in buildings, how these organisms grow in hidden spaces that we don't understand yet. I'm going to give you an example of some mechanistic approaches that, that we've tried to take. These are emission rates in schools in um, Europe and the United States, I think, are the ones that I'm showing. Salinas is in California. This is Denmark, Denmark, and, and Germany. And they're for bacteria, fungi, and PM. And these are the emissions uh, or the number of cells emitted per person per hour in a schoolroom, right? And we get that by just backing things out of a mass balance. We can measure you know, what's in the outside air. We measure ventilation rates. We measure what's in inside air. We know something about deposition. We can put these processes together in simple models or more complex models, depending on the regime of the building or the room that we're sampling. We can back out things like emission rates. The reason emission rates are important is because they're big. right? If you want to apportion the sources of the microbes that you're probably breathing in this room right now, or in many different environments, um, in these schools, certainly, the portion when it goes to indoor emissions is much greater than ventilation. That is, in these schools that we looked at, 99% of the microbes that people were um, exposed to in air came from 
resuspension, not from outdoor air being ventilated in, all right? In different cases in China where there's a lot of microbes in the outdoor air and all the windows were open in these places, that changes. It's a little different for fungi in particular matter, but it's still quite significant for fungi. We can take this type of data and we can overlay it with microbial ecology data, with species data. So we not only get qPCR, okay, but we also um, can now look at medically relevant fungi and we can understand the emissions in those cases as well. Right? So um, <clears throat> in these types of situations, you can understand again that emissions are important um, for exposure versus ventilation. Something like cladosporin, which we know is high concentrations outside, isn't nearly as important. This starts to lead to different types of recommendations. Is cleaning the floor more important for reducing exposure than increasing ventilation? What are the impacts of ventilation? And I think much more broadly through these types of models, and think about chemical, physical models um, in anywhere in a building envelope. We don't have to go back out and sample 200 homes and do a statistical association to get an answer on how ventilation impacts microbial um, ecology in buildings or specific microbes in buildings, right? We can run the models and we can vary ventilation once we've had these models developed and we can get answers. How about transcripts? So I'm just gonna leave with two more thoughts. Um, this is, this is um, some floor dust that's being grown in our lab. These are, this is growth over a week and these are spore equivalents. So this is just quantitation by quantitative PCR for total fungi, right? These are relative humidity levels. This is the original dust concentration and this is if you grow it a week at a 50% RH, 80%, 85, 95, et cetera, right? I think we all know that on building materials, microbes will grow and even on floor dust, microbes will grow. But we're investigating much more um, in depth, what's in that, what's in the floor dust that grows? You know, how much available carbon is there? What kind of nutrients are in the floor dust? And what kind of things like phthalates are degraded during the growth of these types of microorganisms? When we think about hidden spaces and growth in buildings. We have to think about what the substrates are and control those substrates if we want to control that type of growth. I think this is the type of area that's very ripe for transcriptomics, right? Because transcriptomics gives us gene expression, and if we understand this global gene expression in these types of environments and systems, we understand a lot about what they're doing, how they're making a living, how they're growing, which ones are growing versus other ones. Finally, I just want to put in a, another kind of plug for metagenomics. Um, you can do PCR and a few other methods to get to specific types of microorganisms in buildings, and I'm talking about pathogens. But perhaps, you know, one thing that's really been great that's come out of a lot of the, the intense DNA sequencing, especially in buildings, is this understanding that um, buildings can, are not only just bad for us, they can be healthy for us. And there's microbial populations that are good for us that modulate our health. And I think a lot of focus has been on that because that's unknown. But I also think a lot of focus has been on that because these DNA sequencing techniques we use are very bad at detecting pathogens. And we should remember there still are pathogens in buildings in places like hospitals. Bacterial pathogens are really important. Viral pathogens are important to all of us, or at least they should be. We get three to five you know, respiratory diseases, uh, upper respiratory diseases a year. All right? And up till now, we're just sort of dealing with that and we're happy about it. I think we can design buildings in a better way. And so metagenomics can unravel this. We haven't done this in buildings yet, but I know Lindsay Marr and Kyle Bibby are working on this. Um, we've done this in sewage sludge, and you, know, you get even new answers in sewage sludge. And because you can use amplification techniques on these metagenomes, I think it's not too far away to being able to create metagenomics and creating broad pictures of viral diversity, human viral diversity in indoor environments. Okay, with that, uh, this is my last slide. I think the revolution has been done, begun. It's been successful so far. I hope it continues to continue. I hope that there's more quantitative, buildrick-centric, mechanistic approaches in our data analysis and our, in our study designs. Um, ultimately, and what I'll talk about a little bit more this afternoon, is this is our evolution of research. We eventually need to get to a place or target where we think about practice, where we think about medicine, we think about building remediation, we think about building design. Thank you. <laughs>